So let's talk about one more type of non-randomized study design. And any of you who've taken epidemiology have heard about the wonders of the case control study design. And unlike observational studies or natural experiments, this is distinctly different in its formulation than the prospective cohort study approach. So let's look at an example. Researchers were interested in studying the association between alcohol consumption and esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer is a rare condition. If we were to do a prospective study starting with a group of persons who were free of esophageal cancer and assess whether they consumed alcohol or not and follow them over time, we need a large number of subjects just to see enough cases in both groups to be able to estimate the difference with any realistic and useful precision. So another approach when this is the case is to actually choose subjects based on their outcome status. Don't wait for it to happen. Actually round up people based on whether it's happened or not and then assess their exposure status. So what they did for this study is they actually chose 200 persons who were known to have esophageal cancer and they chose about four times as many persons, 775, who did not. And then they asked about their history of alcohol consumption. And the study results in their basic format look like this. Of the 200 cases, 96 were in the higher daily alcohol consumption group and 104 were in the lower. But amongst the controls, a little over 100 were in the higher group as compared to over 650 in the lower group. So before we move on, and start making sense of this data, let me ask you this. Can we estimate just the prevalence or proportion of population with esophageal cancer based on the results from this study? Can we calculate the probability of cancer if you drink more than 80 grams of alcohol per day using the results from this study? Could we compute the relative risk of cancer for those who drink more alcohol per day compared to those who drink less? Well, here's the tricky thing. In case control studies, the risk of the disease has been set by design. The individuals with the disease, the cases have been generally oversampled relative to their appearance in the general population. So the percentage of subjects in the study who has the outcome is greater than the population at large, in most cases by a sizable amount. Hence, the prevalence or risk of this condition in the sample we've taken is much larger than it would be in the population of interest. Prevalence or risk in the sample is a function of the design of the study. In our situation, the researchers set the prevalence at roughly 21%. They chose to take 200 people with the disease and 775 without. But they could have just as easily chosen to take 200 people with esophageal cancer and only 200 without in which case the risk would have been 50%. It's completely set by the number of cases and controls you take. It's artificially established by design, and hence statements about the risk of this disease across the board or within the exposure groups cannot be accurately made with this study design. So we cannot legally or correctly estimate relative risks relating the disease to the exposure of interest, etc., Here's where the odds ratio really shines. We can still correctly compute an odds ratio relating the odds of disease for exposed to unexposed from this type of study design. In these studies, the odds ratio is the only thing to carry us. So just to remind you of what an odds ratio is, recall the estimated odds ratio of an outcome compares the observed odds of the outcome for two groups of individuals and is a function of the risk in each group. So this does convey information about risk for each of the groups, but it's not risk measured directly. Here's the formula for the estimated odds ratio when comparing two groups. One quick way to do this from a two-by-two two table is you, it's like a swashbuckling approach where you take the cross product you pew, pew, of the diagonals, take the first cross product divided by the other, and this would turn out to be equal to the correct computation as well. If we do this here, 96 times 666 over 109 times 104, this odds ratio for this study is 5.6. So there's over a five-fold higher odds of esophageal cancer in the high alcohol consumption group relative to the low. Now, just to be clear, in order to make this cross product approach estimate 
the odds for those exposed to unexposed, you have to set up your two by two table such that the first cell is where case meets exposure group. And we have noticed that our first cell here is it's where cases meets the higher alcohol consumption. So this odds ratio estimates the odds of esophageal cancer for those who drink more compared to those who drank less in our study. So the interpretation of this is that individuals with high alcohol consumption are at over five times the odds of esophageal cancer compared to individuals with low. There may be other systematic differences between the heavier and lighter drinkers that may also contribute to this increased odds. And we could certainly follow up, and the researchers did, we could do a more sophisticated analysis where we tried to account for those and come up with an odds ratio for esophageal cancer, higher alcohol to lower, that had filtered out some of those systematic differences and adjusted odds ratio. And again, that's something we'll be getting towards later in the course. So we'll show you how to do that. But that can be done. But again, we'd have to anticipate what those potential confounding factors are, those systematic differences were, and make sure they were measured in the study itself. The nice thing is, even though we can't directly estimate the relative risk in a case control study, by design, the odds ratio is very close to what the relative risk would be had you performed a cohort study. If your disease of interest, the one you're studying, is rare in the population at large, say less than 1 in 100 persons have it. And think about it. Why would we do a case control study? Well, in many cases, because the outcome is so rare that it would require a large number of people to do a prospective cohort. So we're usually doing case control studies when the outcome is rare, and hence our odds ratio should be comparable to the relative risk, even if we can't estimate the relative risk directly. And if for some reason we do do a case control study where the outcome is not rare in the population at large, the odds ratio still follows the same direction and will still have the same statistical significance or not as the relative risk, but may not very accurately estimate the relative risk. But it won't betray it in terms of the direction of association. But again, in the alcohol esophageal cancer example, 5.6 is an estimate of the odds ratio based on a limited sample of data. So, of course, we learned in last term that we can put confidence intervals on these things, and we'll learn further on that we can create adjusted measures of association that account for some behind-the-scenes systematic differences, say, in the alcohol, high alcohol and low alcohol group, and also put confidence intervals on that adjusted measure. So let me just remind you and show you one more way to do confidence intervals for an odds ratio. We showed you how to do it with the CSI command before, but there's also a command just for case control studies. Furthermore, how do we test if the population odds ratio is one or not, i.e. after accounting for sampling variability or not, whether the evidence of the association holds up at the larger population level. Whether this association we've seen between alcohol consumption and esophageal cancer still stands after we account for the uncertainty in our data-based estimates. And of course, we could use Fisher's exact test or chi-squared test with large numbers. So one more way to do this in state, instead of using the CSI command, which you could use and put the option OR at the end, but if you want something that's just for case control studies, there's something called the CCI command. So instead of CSI, it's CCI. And it's exactly the same setup, and it really does similar things, except it only reports the appropriate measures of association, the odds ratio. So if we had set up our two-by-two two table in the following fashion, with the rows representing the outcome, yes or no, columns being the exposure, yes or no, cell counts A, B, C, D, then the command syntax would be CCI, and then those four cell counts. So in our alcohol esophageal cancer, there's the 2x2 two two table, and our command would be CCI, 96, 104, 109, and then 666. And here are the results from stating. You see you get output that looks very similar to what we saw before. But you look at the bottom and you notice there's no relative risk or risk difference reported because that is not a legal measure of association in the case control study. Sato doesn't know what study. If we put CSI here, it would willingly estimate those quantities. It doesn't know what we've done. But the CCI command gives it a heads up that this is a case control study. So it only estimates the odds ratio, and you can see that there, with a 95% confidence interval from 3.9 to 8.1. 
so suggest even after accounting for sampling variability, substantially higher odds. And of course, this is not accounting for any other systematic differences, and we'll get to how to do that later on. And then if you go and look at the chi-squared test for this, you can see it's, well, we knew the confidence interval for the odds ratio did not include one, and this is statistically significant with a very low p-value. So roughly speaking, the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio of esophageal cancer for those consuming greater than 80 grams of alcohol per day compared to those consuming 80 grams or less is roughly 4 to 8. So again, why would we even bother calculating the odds ratio when we can calculate relative risk? Well, we actually can't calculate relative risk in case control studies. In cohort studies, we can calculate an odds ratio along with the other measures of association. So the odds ratio seems like the lesser of the measure of association, but it really shines in case control studies because it's the only thing that can be calculated. And luckily, as we just reviewed and we saw in SR1, the odds ratio does inform us about risk, and we just showed if the outcome of interest is rare overall in the population at large, then even though we're estimating the less favored odds ratio, it's a good estimate for the relative risk, and its confidence interval, et cetera, translates. We don't need another type of test, even in case control studies, to test between association between outcome and exposure, because that chi-squared and Fisher's exact test, testing whether the underlying proportions or risk is the same, even though we can't directly measure risk, the only way the odds ratio will be equal to 1 is if the risks are equivalent. So testing using the chi-squared, again, tests these three different presentations of the same null and alternative hypotheses. So testing for the odds ratio equal to 1 is equivalent to testing that the relative risk is equal to 1 is equivalent to testing the underlying risks are equivalent.